with that blue. And that's a scary song because it talks about a woman walking down the street and seeing almost the skulls and the eyes of the men that she was in love with, whom she is still madly in love with, but who she cannot presume to be able to see again. But she still wants to. And she's saying, well, why do I see yours? Your face, your smile means nothing to me anymore. <laughs> but I still see your eyes, and I will continue to see your eyes. And I'm still in love with you as I was before, but I will probably never see you again. And this is based on the great Juliet Greco. Mm, it's a very existential song. Mm. and Very pretty, very sort of yes. compelling in a way that I, Piaf wasn't. Handsome. Right. Oh, no, I wouldn't say uh, Piaf was even handsome. <laughs> she looked like a sewer rat, but when Piaf performed, there was a true transcendence. It was not her about her at all. It was about every word of the song, and she was a possessed performer. Minimal gesture, every change of the face represented every word, every chord change, this was a true, great, great musician. And another thing ab about her that's so great, and as I do some of her songs, Padam Padam, mm -hmm. among them, Autumn Leaves also, is that she understood, she had perfect pitch, whether this is definable by some scientific notion of being able to say this is, I can sing you a C now or recognize a C. She right. sang every note of the song that was composed for her. She didn't go and do Sprechstimme because she couldn't sing the notes. She sang every note of the song. She understood the chord progression. She understood the necessity of changing the tempo of the dynamic. And her gestures on stage, since I've seen films of her, were conducting the orchestra, were also discussing the song, changing the tempo and the dynamic. She was the director of the band. I mean, this was a great musician. Right. Got a lot of respect for her more and more every year. And a huge influence on you because you do the same sort of larger-than-life, complete focus. Here's mm. everything you need to know in my slightest gesture. When I see you perform, it's like I kind of forget that you're singing. <laughs> I, I'm watching this huge movie. It's not really just about you it's singing. It's not about me at all. It's about the whole thing. It's not about me. I'm not there. I'm not, I used to perform in the darkness. I really, it, it's not about me. And it's that's why I always try to get off the stage as fast <laughs> as possible. I only do encores because the audience has paid for them, and so I do them. Right. Well, at Carnegie Hall, you had to. It was perfect. It was gorgeous. You did a couple, and they were worth it. <laughs> I was applauding my heart out. <laughs> well, Thank if I you. had a heart, I would have been... You jaded bitch. <sighs> <laughs> Let's talk about Padam Padam, then. This I'm is okay. another woman. She's walking down the street. <laughs> they do a lot of that in Paris. Yeah, oh, well, what is there? <laughs> you know, in Paris, the songs are walking down the street, trying to forget, trying to pretend you're living a normal life. <laughs> trying whilst, to forget. <laughs> whilst in these stiletto heels and smoking a cigarette. The songs have this idea of going around in a ball, in, in a circle, this idea of a roulette of some sort. It's very interesting to me. Windmill, windmills in your mind. Oh, yes, <laughs> darling. Like Thank you so much. <laughs> I think of Kiki and Herb doing that, actually. But <laughs> The thing is, is that this woman's walking down the street, and she suddenly hears the marching bands and people having a good time, and the carnivals that existed at the time when she was in love with this man, she thought she had forgotten, and she starts screaming at her everyone, can't you hear the sound? Can't you hear these bands? Can't you hear this? Can't you hear what's happening? Can't you hear it? And people look at her and she's... Having a she's, little Mama Rose moment there. <laughs> mm, very good. But she's saying this and she's saying, can't you hear this? And then she's saying, I know that one day that I'm going to go insane because everything reminds me of this person. And so that's the thing about these songs that is interesting is that the... Um, there's many levels of the songs, and of course the levels are orchestrated by the composers who wrote them because they have the civility to give us verse, chorus, verse. But within the verse, chorus, verse are secondary verses, secondary choruses, intermezzi, all these things that one can expect from classical music, but one must Complexity, beg for sure. in popular music. Right. So assuming that people have souls to be abused... And someone has written a song called A Soul That's Been Abused. Ronnie Earl. Great, great guitar player. Wrote a lot of great songs. American. I heard it. Yeah. He lives in Massachusetts, I believe. And I heard it on a Hubert Sumlin record. He's a guy who played with Helen Wolf for a long time. Right. Great guitar player. Great guitar master. And I don't know who was singing it, but I heard the song and just, that was it. I had to do the song. Great. Again, great chord changes. Blues format, but not more than a blues. It has a blues format, and then it goes into a very weird bridge, which which is 
I'm still trying to figure out that bridge because it can be played in so many different ways. It's a very interesting song. So this song is is a terrifying song because it's, it's <laughs> another terrifying song. I, They're I'm all scared, terrifying. I'm scared to ask what terrifies the great and powerful Diamond de Glass. What could that be that terrifies uh, you about those? Uh, 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 love songs. A love song. A real love song. I mean, love, love. Forget about it. I can't. Oh God. And so anyway, <laughs> it's all that's been abused. Basically, one enters into a an agreement like this sort of thing. Pact with these, the devil. This, that's what it is. <laughs> you agree to be a victim. Someone asked me to discuss this in terms of power and feminism, and I said, please, I am not going to put myself in this, this sort of feminist discussion when I'm discussing something like this. We must try to remember it that the Greeks existed before these sorts of discussions. <laughs> and they are talking about a group of murderers. You know, Greek tragedy was written by people who had a blood imperative that goes far before Freud and the justifications for behavior and so forth. So the soul has been abused. The person is saying, you know, I'm really sorry that our relationship had to end. You know, I know that it wasn't your fault and you couldn't help doing the things that you did. But now... It's over, you know, and it's it's those damning words that one is always afraid to hear. Who has who is of ill temper, has bad temper, has a tendency towards impulsive and unimpressive behavior, has concerns, rage, and that sort of thing. That you know is not a popular <laughs> in psychological circles. <laughs> oh, popular might not be the right word. <laughs> Certainly interesting, fascinating, compelling, but probably not very useful socially. <laughs> no. And social behavior, antisocial behavior. Yes. I can't wait to hear that. I've never oh, heard yes. it, and I, I bet it's going to be right up my murder ballad kind of alley. Let's also talk a little bit about eight men and four women, which oh, sounds like a that. party. Well, it's, 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 it's a party in many ways, in that I sample Elmer Wayne. Wayne Hanley's confession at the police station (laughs) did sell my photograph online. He painted my photograph to a fan of his, Wanda, and she came to the last concert. She's a friend of my friend Michael Flanagan's. Somebody told me about this, and I said, oh, who is this man? And so then I found out who he was, Mm. and I thought, well, uh, since he's making money off of me, I think I'll make a little bit of money (laughs) off of him. It's America, after all. And so I got his confession where he was confessing. He said, mama, he said, mama. I killed Dean. He's talking about killing Dean, and I had to do it, and I am guilty. And it was just this beautiful voice, and Texas or terribly Texas? cute, yeah. terribly cute. It's such a big misfortune. So every time I play the doors of the prison slamming on Ovi Wright, because he wrote this song, you know, saying, you know, I'm really sorry I had to kill your lover, but in fact, you cheated on me, and I didn't want to kill you. I wanted to kill him, so of course you can understand I'm not guilty, and blah, blah, blah. Every time you hear the prison door slamming is when I'm playing the piano bass part of the piano, and then I got Elmer Wayne talking about, talking to his mom, I am guilty, and blah, blah, blah. It's very sweet. Sounds very, very delightful. sweet. And he sounds just like the most su- sweetest natured son in the world. Good and, old boy. Oh, my God. My God. <laughs> so unfortunate. So I enjoy doing that song. I enjoy the irony of the song because of the way Ovi writes things. It's so impassioned. That narcissistic edge you have when you are thinking about how terrible it is you're going to do 20 to life or get the death penalty, and it's not your fault. You just had to kill the guy because, you know, had your to. wife was cheating on you. I understand that. You know, I understand that. <laughs> we all understand that. You know, that's the way it goes, buddy, you know. Well, one, one of my 